right, welcome back to another episode of the Startup Junkies podcast. Thank you for tuning in from wherever and however you're tuning in with us. Uh, my name is Caleb Talley. I am a Startup Junkie joined by my Startup Junkie co-host, Jeff Amaran. How's it going? I'm glad to be here. So it's, it's another good day to drink bourbon and whiskey. It's, it's right. winter again in it's Northwest, winter. Northwest it's Arkansas. So it must so be a good day to, to drink. Do, exactly. Uh, we're excited to be joined today uh, by our new friends from uh, Boulders and Brews. We've got Fallon Cardoza, Patrick Randall, and Jason Lamb with us today. How's it going? It's hey. going good. Very Thanks good. for having us. Well, uh, we are very glad to have you. So um, let's start off. We'll go, we'll go down the line with uh, origin stories. Uh, Jeff likes to say the Wolverine origin story. That's right. <laughs> when did you realize you had superpowers? <laughs> Fallon, I'll let you go first. Um, you go first. Okay. Um, so I'm Patrick Randall. Um, origin story, no real superhero, um, but I've always come from a line of entrepreneurs from my brother. Me and him kind of, um, he's got his own insurance company, um, so he's always kind of helped me motivate um, and to go into small business or um, some type of entrepreneurial path. Um, and then I was getting too old for Ultimate Frisbee, and I was looking for a sport to get into in my 30s. Um, I tried biking, and that was brutal. And so I was like, all right, something less cardio but more strength. And one of my friends who was out there playing Ultimate Frisbee um, introduced me to rock climbing. And she's like, well, let me take you to Horseshoe Canyon, which is just probably about um, two hours away from here, two hours east. And man, we just, I w bought rock climbing shoes that next day, bought a harness, bought rope, didn't even need it, bought way too much rope. You don't, <laughs> the rope I bought is like only good for Yosemite. <laughs> Nothing, I, it was absolutely the wrong thing to buy. But I had no clue, I was super excited. And met Fallon and then we were just in the backyard and hey, let's start a rock climbing gym in uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas. So that's kind of my origin to where we are now. Cool. Yeah, so um, prior to this, I fell in love with rock climbing about five years ago. Um, I started bouldering one day at Climb Bentonville and then fell in love with it, bought all my stuff, and then went and lived in a van for over a year. I traveled all over the US, traveled all over Canada rock climbing, bouldering, multi-pitch climbing, doing all of that. And then, yeah, two years ago, met Patrick. And like he said, backyard, he was like, let's open a rock climbing gym. And I was like, no, let's not. <laughs> and then a few months later, quit my job and went full time on it. And we've been doing this for over a year now. Very cool. How'd you get roped into this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so my, uh, my story is also interesting, I guess. Uh, I'm Jason Lamb. So Originally from Dallas, um, I didn't know Patrick and Fallon until we just celebrated like our one we year did. knowing yeah. each other. <laughs> um, so I actually went to pharmacy school and was going to pursue opening my own pharmacy. And then I had someone show me, introduce me to bouldering. And at first, I actually didn't like it <laughs> at all. <laughs> and then just slowly, like the idea, it was me and him slowly had the idea of opening our own bouldering gym because I was doing the business aspect and he mm -hmm. wanted to do mm -hmm. like the actual mm -hmm. uh, management of the gym. And then we heard that Patrick and Fallon were also interested in mm -hmm. opening a gym in Fayetteville. And we were like, well, let's just combine together and partner. <laughs> uh, that person is not with us anymore today for other reasons. I mean, we can get into it if we want to. But, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, went to pharmacy school, graduated, and was going to be a pharmacist. And as I was helping found with the startup phase, realized that I like being an entrepreneur more than being a pharmacist. And here we are today. <laughs> We're all like active par our partners in the in the gym. So. Was that a fun conversation with your folks? My mom actually was very supportive because like she came. Yeah. Uh, she came from Dallas and she she started climbing and she loved it and she was like, "Do whatever makes you so, happy." So you got her bought in. Early. Yeah, oh, I, got you. I had to I, got I had to introduce cool. a gym to her before yeah. she can Very <laughs> before cool. telling her I was gonna not have a job. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. That's cool. Cindy's one of our best salesmen. She yeah, Cindy, that's great. Yeah, yeah. His that's mom really is great. one of the best. She yeah. is. So I ask um, a question for you. A lot of times when they, they talk about creating a business and you talk about the founders and the personalities for tech businesses, they'll say. You have to have a hacker, a hustler, and a hipster. So think about that. For, for your business, for Boulder and Brews, what roles do you each do? And it doesn't have to be within that context, but you all bring unique skills and talents. How do you divide the business up? Who does what, I guess? So I would first say Fallon um, 
Fallon's been at this for a year. So Jason really got involved once he finished pharmacy school. So Fallon had already been working on this for about six months. Mm -hmm. um, and then Jason graduated and then we needed help. Um, in the business. And so Fallon has already honestly been on this full time. So she sadly right now has like more of like, she can create a list. That is what she does. She's extremely organized, never forgets a conversation. <laughs> and I barely can remember what I had yesterday. <laughs> so like what Fallon brings to the table is all the administration stuff. Mm -hmm. And she previously worked at a climbing gym. And so her expertise from coming from a previous climbing gym has been exponentially helpful, especially like customer service like she's actually one of the best salesmen too but she's just absolutely being genuine too um so um and then jason i think his role is ex involved has expanded yeah, yeah. um originally <laughs> originally started before i came on full-time was just the marketing aspect mm -hmm. and then um with the other partner that's not with us i helped we were the one i was really the one that did the business mm -hmm. plan mm -hmm. and so like i brought the business aspect because uh, in pharmacy school, there was a business competition, a national business competition, mm -hmm. and my team won. And so we really just took that model that we built for it because it was it was essentially like how can you uh, your present this competition was you present to in five investors right. and judges right. and um, essentially like would would you invest in this business? Sure. And so we just took that model and then applied it to the bouldering gym. And so like I had that business background, but obviously I was going for pharmacy. Um, but then today it's really like finance, marketing, and now setting. Gotcha. Um, I'm into photography, and so really that artistic side uh, comes out. So you're help you're helping create the place, yeah. Sort of the experience yeah, of the putting place. Putting the holds on the wall. Nice. Um, Lots of ladder so, time. Yeah, a lot of ladder <laughs> time. I got a lot of uh, muscle in my legs now. <laughs> Very good. And I think uh, I'm the newest to the business. Um, I think my role is electrician, plumber. Um, He's and, a good handyman. Yeah. <laughs> Other duties as a sign, right? Yeah, like whenever you renovate an old Piggly Wiggly into a rock climbing gym, there's a lot of issues. So, like, it wasn't made our incoming water. I mean, we can go into the weeds of the amount of leaks that we have and like trying to get our showers to operate one day and then the next day just completely going out. So mm -hmm. there is that grind to opening a brick and mortar in an sure. old historic district. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's mine. And then I'm the weakest of the climbers of the group. I came from Ultimate Frisbee. And so I really relate to the newer climbers. And so um, with his setting, both of them are really strong. So what they're like, oh, that's simple. To me, I'm like, Guys, that's really hard. Like, I can't. I can't do that. And I'm guessing there's going to be some other people that can't. Sure. So trying to fill in that hole for the newcomers and making them feel welcome and opening up the space to make it feel like home. And you're on Dixon Street in Fayetteville, right? That's mm -hmm. the location. Yeah. And how did you, why did you decide that that was a great location for the business? One, my biggest concern when we were looking at the space was that there was a drop ceiling. So number mm -hmm. one, when we opened up the space, it was the drop ceiling. Like, all right, is this space going to be big enough? And we have a truss layout. So our walls are actually embedded into the trusses. Mm -hmm. And so our biggest concern was like, all right, if we pull down this drop ceiling, our like, I think what, at least the standard bouldering gym is 15. Mm -hmm. And so ours goes from 15 down to like 13 and a half feet, depending oh, gotcha. on where you're at. Um, so once we got that check mark boxed, all right, the next thing was the parking. Dixon Street parking is not fantastic at all, and it's getting harder and harder. Well, now we actually were very blessed that the location actually comes with the largest private parking lot in Dixon Street. Nice. And then third was just like, hey, like the amount of window space that we have. And then like yeah. we purposely chose the color of our walls and the lighting to hit off that Baltic birch. Hmm wood to like really at night that it, the whole thing just glows hmm. and so that's really like the image that just kept making cool. us like hey this is going to be sick once it's opened hmm. and so uh, having that where it is i mean are you getting in um you know foot traffic from people that are just curious like what is this oh yeah, yeah regularly yeah. people yeah. come and they're like we didn't even know this was here yeah. we've been there three months huh. so it's happening regular that people are walking by and they're like what is climbing what is all of this and they come in and ask questions yeah and it definitely helps that we're right like two minutes from the college <laughs> there's mm -hmm. our uh student 
uh, memberships actually more than our regular membership. Mm -hmm. And so they definitely helped carry us through the hard times. That's great. Uh, But I do want to add to what Patrick said, you know, um, as you guys know, whenever you're starting up a business, location, location, location is the Mm -hmm. most important thing. And when you think of Fayetteville, first thing that comes to mind is Dixon Street. And it helps that we're on that, Mm -hmm. that spot. Yeah, and bringing something healthy to Dixon, too. For sure. Yeah, mm-hmm. lots of different factors. Yeah, that was the, my buddy. He's been a bartender on Dixon Street for, like, 20 years. He's like, thank God it's not another bar. And I was just like, you're welcome. We'll bring some health and some fitness back. And, yeah. Um, so adding that diversity to mm-hmm. Dixon Street, I think, was really helpful mm-hmm. for the community. And exposing the sport to people um, from all walks, mm-hmm. like, that would never even be interesting climb, but since it's in the right location, they're like, all right, mm-hmm. maybe give it a shot. Mm-hmm. So that's really helped. Um, and as you think about kind of getting people engaged with climbing, uh, obviously Northwest Arkansas has kind of this infrastructure and um, infatuation with uh, mountain biking, cycling, and that sort of thing. Um, but Arkansas, Northwest Arkansas is ripe for, you know, a wave of, uh, of interest in climbing. What would you say is probably, um, what would most Arkansans not know, I guess, about Arkansas's climbing scene? Yeah, so we actually have the Mecca of outdoor climbing two hours away from us in Jasper. So we have Horseshoe yeah. Canyon Ranch. Um, people from all over the world come to develop routes just here in Arkansas. So it's such a great beginner place for people to be able to go out. All of the anchors and everything's fixed and ready for you. So, I mean, it's right in our backyard. Yeah, I would say, and there's more to come too. Um, one of our main priorities is stabil- or, uh, land conservation. Mm-hmm. You know, like me and Fallon fell in love with the sport outside. And so like using the gym as a vessel to expand Arkansas climbing, land conservation, mm-hmm. anything we can do to help open up more space. I forgot what the land trust guy told us about the amount of like percent of land that we're losing per day um, to private equities and private entities. And it's all climbing space. And so, um, but yeah, I mean, like there's new stuff going up all the time. Our head setter is one of the lead bolters in Arkansas. And he's just like, the stuff I'm doing right now is going to put Arkansas back on the map. Because like people like, Alex Honnell, who did mm-hmm. free solo, mm-hmm. Tommy Codwell, they've all come to Arkansas. They climbed the stuff, they've developed some routes, and then they left. Mm-hmm. And so trying to get that interest to come back in and some of the stuff that's being worked on under the ground is just super exciting. And mm-hmm. to get what they're talking about back on the map and get mm-hmm. Arkansas climbing going again is just so exciting. Mm-hmm. There's just more to come. It seems like that model with cycling and mountain biking has been kind of bringing those influencers in that space, the kind of pros, the experts, and then with them come the competitions and the different entities. And I could see that kind of being a similar model, mm-hmm. um, so to speak. Yeah. And I, there's a, there's a college team. There's an art. We're trying to help develop a traveling um, indoor climbing team Mm -hmm. and kind of help them like whenever i was in college i had the ultimate frisbee team and we just got drunk and we traveled all over the united Mm -hmm. states and played ultimate frisbee and it was the best time of my life and then uh i was talking to the climbing team like do you guys have anything like like, oh no like we can't we can't even qualify for texas or oklahoma events and i'm like why they're like um because we're not big enough to even to compete or apply to those comp- like to those competitions. I'm like, you're telling me the two flattest states in the country and we as an Arkansas team can't even like do indoor bouldering competition. Like where like are we getting away from the sport? Mm. And so we've really taken some pride in like, hey, let's bring Arkansas back as like not even like an indoor climbing team, mm-hmm. but like an outdoor climbing team. Mm. So I mean if they've got Quidditch teams that travel around the SEC, we can probably get right. some, some bouldering. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It might be a little more engaging, yeah. right? <laughs> I mean, there's only so many Harry Potter fans right, yeah. around. What's been the What's been the uh, most surprising thing about getting the business up and running so far, good or bad? Oh. Uh, Oh uh, yeah, there's a so lot. many things. Um, yeah, I think I, I think the one that does not surprise us anymore, but surprised us in the beginning, is when people say, or the vendors that we talked to have said, "I've never seen this before." In uh, the years I've done this, the twenty plus years, yeah, mm-hmm. we've never seen this before. 
But yet, we are the outlier. <laughs> Everything that goes wrong. <laughs> yeah. We have been told we're the anomaly in certain situations because in the 20 years of business, this is the first time they've ever seen this. With happen. the electromechanical stuff or what, whatever construction, yeah. building, exactly. everything. Yeah. With the holds, yeah. with the boards, with, I mean, the hmm. everything you can think of. It's happened 10 plus times already. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because, I mean, it's like, it's all like the construction aspect of just clearing out the building, breaking down walls and stuff like that. Like that's all expected. Right. But the climbing stuff that you're investing hundreds of thousands of dollars in. Sure. You're just like, all right, you guys should have this down to a science if you're out there selling it. You would think so, right? Right. And so every vendor, every step of the process from our pads to our walls to our holds, man, like I've just never seen this before. And I'm like, man, if this is, you're probably the 12th person of a different vendor that has never seen this before. So, and then like we even got Take told, notes. yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then they were giving us grief. It was like, well, your business is going so smooth. Like you guys should be really proud of where you're at. Like this setback should be expected. And I'm just like, no, like just because we're doing everything right doesn't mean we should be penalized for it. And that's kind of the mentality that some of our vendors that we worked with were trying to push us towards like, well, no, this is always part of the process. And it's like us doing our homework and being prepared mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you guys get a pass for not being prepared. <laughs> yeah, and so, so like our gym opened late because of a padding situation, even though it wasn't our fault, it was the vendor's fault, but it did delay our opening for weeks, which was pretty major at the time. <laughs> and so I've been surprised at the amount that I've had to advocate for myself and for the gym, mm -hmm. the amount of phone calls I've had to have for hours for brand new product that I shouldn't really have to be advocating for. Like I have been treated really badly in this business with vendors mm -hmm. to the point where like I'm in my car crying <laughs> because I'm like, I don't understand why that where this miscommunication is coming from. If we've spent, like he said, hundreds of thousands of dollars <laughs> with certain companies to still be treated badly. So I've been really surprised by that. That's, I would say on the flip side, you know, one thing that it taught us is, you know, I'm sure you guys can about just learning how to adapt. Yeah. You know, she mentioned that we, we had to delay our opening by mm -hmm. a month. And mm -hmm. one of the things that we did to adapt was, okay, well, what if we just open our cafe section, get some mm -hmm. revenue coming in sure. two weeks Get earlier. people comfortable yeah. coming there, right? So people know they can see us finish out building out the walls while they get their idea. cup of coffee. That's so scrappy. We, we learned to adapt. And even though we have a schedule and a plan, like <laughs> <laughs> it goes sidetracked, but then we just learned to adapt and how to, yeah. how to pivot and how to just yeah. make things work. What do, you, what do you attribute the the vendor failures to? Are they having trouble getting the right people? Is it supply chain? Is, you know what? Because it, 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 you're not alone. I could tell you some stories about a certain uh, treadmill vendor that shall go nameless because someday they might be a sponsor. But it was <laughs> it was remarkable the amount of money I spent on a high end treadmill and the fact that the motor had flaws in it the moment that they set it up. And I was having to torment the hell out of them to get a technical support out there. I mean, just as an example, and that is, it was a high end, but a home version is, I can only imagine what you all are seeing. Yeah. What do you attribute to though? Is it, are they having trouble getting the right staff or are they having trouble with supply chain? What do you think it is? I think COVID changed a lot of it. I think pro, like pre COVID, I would have conversations and they felt a lot different than post COVID. Mm -hmm. I would have conversations and I've had vice presidents of company tell me they don't have time for me in a four minute phone call, although they're the one that gave me the wrong product to begin with and the wrong bad product that like wow. unraveled within, you know, two months of us being open, even though it was brand new and we spent hundreds of thousands. Wow. So, um, I think that the world is just different since COVID, the conversations that I'm having mm. with people, because it's not that they're having supply chain issues. It's just that they're making mistakes. And then when I try to hold them accountable, they're not, they don't hold themselves accountable. They're not responsive. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's yeah. interesting. And I, yeah. And I, just to um, add on, I would also say it's just like the whole, like the mentality is kind of wrong. Like obviously like the customer is always right is not always accurate either mm -hmm. but at the same time it's gone most switched to the actual mm -hmm. uh, opposite end of the pendulum where um it doesn't matter if the customer's right or wrong the, i mean the whole power is in their hands yeah. mm -hmm. and they're not afraid to muscle like like fallon said like she's being she's saying this really nicely but i mean she had a four-hour scream out yes. match with some of the ceos of some of the companies mm -hmm. that it was their mistake but they're like hey you don't have time for this i'm like man, you guys got money in the bank. Like we like, and like what Jason said about like how we adapted with the um, 
coffee and opening up the coffee early. Sure. The only reason we did that was because we had already told our staff to put their two weeks in for their mm-hmm. other jobs. So we had all this onboarding of staff. Yep. We yep. didn't have the money to wow. keep them. We didn't know what the next month looked like. Right, right. Um, and we were delayed by the pads. We were only told a week before we were expecting the pads yeah. that they're going to be delayed a month. Wow. So we think that we're opening in two weeks. That gives us a week to onboard the staff, create our POS system, and do the pads. And then we are opening for grand opening. Right before we tell everyone, hey, like, you will be onboarded this week, we got told the, the pads were going to be delayed a month. Wow. And so it was just like, oh, no. <laughs> and so, like Jason yeah. said, we opened up the cafe. But yeah. you got through it. We got through you it. improvised. You got through it. And and the uptake has been pretty good, right? I mean, you've got you got a fair number of membership. Describe how how it's been once you got through those initial setup issues. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's been honestly magical to go into the space and watch people enjoy the safe space that we intentionally mm-hmm. created for them to walk into and feel safe and feel happy and feel like they have a community away from their home in Texas or wherever. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I'm told almost daily that people feel all of these really great positive feelings and being able to know that we were attributed to that is just like so reassuring and just beautiful to know that we created that for them. Yeah, I would, I would definitely say like the gym and the walls and the plot and like everything that's inside the gym is great, but it's only a vessel. Mm-hmm. You know, your your business is the community. Mm-hmm. And so everything everything that we do, we have QR codes. Not many people have QR codes under their gym to where they, basically we get real time data if people are enjoying the routes that we set up. Mm-hmm. Like once the wall and the holds are on the wall. The second most important thing to a gym, besides just like genuine customer service, is route setting. Mm-hmm. And that's what kind of Jason's taken over. And so we have real-time data after a week of the holds being on, we get that input from the community being like, hey, we agree with your setting. We really enjoy your routes. We're like, hey, this was trash. Like, why did y'all put this up? And so we go back to the drawing board and be like, hey, like we got a hole. Like the our customers are not happy with this grading of a route. And so, and so we adapted, like we hung up our first, um, we did a buddy problem, which was beautiful. We did that for Valentine's Day. Mm-hmm. But this new set that we just did um, incorporated that data that we heard from the community. So we're super excited to see how people enjoy it and see what the data is coming back from those QR codes. That's cool. And how, I mean, given, given that, and it sounds like you're very community focused and customer focused, customer experience focused. How would you describe the culture that's, that you're, your team culture that's evolving. Talk about it. How would you describe it? It's been so cool. The staffing out with each other outside of work literally every day. We <laughs> it's almost we, a problem. We yeah. just, it's, it's a problem. They all want to go climb together and hang out. And I'm like, I have to staff the gym. That's yeah. why I hire you. Um, but, I mean, it is so beautiful to see them. We just did our 90-day evals with them because mm-hmm. we just hit our three-month mark. And, you know, every single one of them had nothing bad to say about their teammates, about their coworkers. Everybody is Everybody told us it's their best job that they've ever had mm-hmm. and how appreciative they are and everything. So, I mean, I it feels amazing to me. Yeah, just to add on that, I mean, you can if, you can tell that the employees enjoy their job because mm-hmm. the way they present to the to our right. customers, um, like we treat them as family and they treat our members as family. And so really that's, I mean, I've told our employees like, we work for them because they are the one who like talk to the customers, sure, yeah. you know? Sure. And so, um, but yeah, you, you can see how transparent that it becomes, uh, it, it becomes just from how our team operates. That's great. Winning yeah. cultures end up winning. Yeah. And that starts with the, with the leadership, with the founders. That's Sounds like you're off to a great start. We try. <laughs> well, and like the culture just feels like home. Like, I mean, we have some of our members that are, get there at, 10 in the morning and they'll stay till 10 at night and they just live. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And it's just like, man, like they don't, I mean, I don't know what else they'd be doing that other time, <laughs> but like the fact that they feel comfortable in that space almost for 12 hours straight mm-hmm. and they'll sit there, drink coffee, hang out, do homework, they'll remote work. Mm-hmm. Um, and they'll go back on a route and then come back, hang out. And so it's just, it is truly incredible. And it's truly awesome that our staff love each other so much, but like, us trying to plan for spring break. They're like, well, if I have to work, how am I going to go on the climbing trip with all the other? And like, they were all strangers before this. <laughs> they were. Yeah. Most of them were. 
Yeah. yeah. And so, like, they're like, well, how do, how do I go on that Utah climbing trip with everyone else? And I'm like, you, you don't. Like, <laughs> so you had to draw so straws this or something. something. This, is, this is why they call it work. Yeah. 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 Have like a little uh, uh, spring break lottery there. So you yeah. stay in art. Yeah. Um, it sounds like y'all have created uh, a top down, you know, incredible culture, created community. Uh, it sounds like I didn't know that y'all had, you know, created a space in addition to the gym element where people are just kind of like hanging out, working and doing homework or whatever else. Um, what does that experience look like for somebody who is completely novice? Like, you know, they want to get into um, into climbing. Um, and what's that process look like? How do they get engaged? Um, are there folks there working with them? Um, yeah, so he might be asking for himself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of see that look in his eye. Yeah. He's interested. He might have a new customer here. It looks like it. <laughs> Um, barrier to entry really isn't that bad. All you really have to do is come in. We have rental shoes, and then you just sign the waiver, and then you're able to climb. A lot of our Google reviews talk about the staff giving beta. Beta is how you get from the bottom to the top of the climb, so they'll help you with those terms. And so, honestly, most of our members are brand new climbers that I've never met before in our community that are just now starting to fall in love with it. Yeah, I would say probably more than half of yeah. our members are new climbers. Mm -hmm. um, and so we really focus on putting a lot of, um, I would say easy climbs, just mm -hmm. so that easy and fun climbs, just so that they, the new climbers can enjoy uh, bouldering so that you can get hooked on and <laughs> get yeah. that dopamine rush whenever mm -hmm. you send the problem. So you have some bunny trail equivalent um, climbs. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and like always knowing like that all of our staff are all climbers also helps. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that we do that a lot of other gyms don't do is that we allow our staff to route set. Mm -hmm. And it's burned us some, but then at the same time, like, there's, Jason can speak for himself, like, there's not a better feeling than watching someone climb your route and, like, either they fall, but they get stuck in the crux that you created. Like, it's always, it's a problem-solving game. It's a, it's a very, it's a physical workout, which I really enjoy. Upper body physical workout with a mental stimulation because yeah. Jason as a setter is trying to trick you mm -hmm. at certain <laughs> degrees. He's trying to trick yeah. you and it's your job. It's kind of your role to be like, Hey, can I figure out Jason's brain? Like, and the grading gets harder. The holds get smaller. The technique gets finer mm -hmm. as you go up in grades. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I really like, and that's why we do draw a lot of engineers, architects, um, PhDs to the sport because there's a, big mental component to Stimulating. it. Stimulating. Yeah. yeah. It's like it's actual 3D chess. Yes, yeah. exactly. Like yeah. we are trying to trick yeah. you and we watch people, like when we're watching people on a route, it's like, oh, is he going to hit the move? Nope, went with the wrong hand. Yeah. He's got to be really strong to get himself out of the hole. Yeah. And so it is. And like, and when you have your staff that's also mm -hmm. created the routes, they can help you too and be like, hey, I sit this one. You probably want to go with your left hand instead of your right hand. Mm -hmm. You kind of want to use your foot first before you go with your hands first. Mm -hmm. So having that like, little beta mm -hmm. bouncing um, aspect in that they created the route. The person who's delivering your coffee also mm -hmm. set the route. Mm -hmm. That's so, cool. And you've got conventional workout equipment there as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if somebody wanted it, they weren't sure, they wanted to kind of ease into it. They liked the coffee, they liked the scene, but they wanted to get a regular workout. They could ease into the other, right? I mean, into the, the climbing part of it. Yeah, yeah. Our, our downstairs, we have two squat racks, you know, dumbbells, barbells, like, we have everything except for a cable machine. And I mean, that's all you really need as a climber is those free weights. Mm -hmm. and, uh, a lot of the students use downstairs because, um, I mean, Patrick went to the university. There's not much <laughs> options to work out. Yeah. And that's that was kind of the plan. It was just like, you know, the high, hyper has its um, deficiencies in some aspects. I mean, they just, I mean, it's just a huge campus, mm -hmm. you know, and they got two squat racks for this entire student population. So I was like, all right, I'll put two squat racks down here. And, you know, if you can't, if you can't, like, if you can't make downstairs work for you, like, it's not going to be like your perfect gym. Sure. I mean, we are a rock climbing gym. First. But you can do pull-ups and, and, and dips there, right? You can do the basics. Yep. You can do the basics you can get every part of your body. It's just up to you to like, kind of make it work. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, but we're going to be focusing on the rock climbing. Um, and we actually, we have three yoga classes that go on right now. Um, that's free to our members. Um, yoga is super popular, more popular than I thought it was. 
And then we got this like badass female that comes on Sunday that kicks all of our asses in a hit workout and she makes it work. I mean, my legs are still sore from <laughs> Sunday. Sunday. <laughs> wow. so. And you're uniquely positioned because if you live or you're, you know, if you are a student or you live on this end of town, I mean, your Planet Fitness, your Fitness One, you know, after work, you're driving across Mm -hmm. town in yeah. that traffic towards Weddington and that's a nightmare yeah so you're uniquely positioned to catch folks that you know maybe they just want that entry into a, a, a traditional gym they can walk or ride their bike yeah exactly yeah. and yeah. it's close enough to do that yeah. Yeah. and that's what we're working on right now I just went did the uh, biker friendly workshop um, with experience Fayetteville mm -hmm. um, and so really you know like we had one lady who was like every route she did she would take her bicycle and like obviously it's probably an eight thousand dollar bike so like i understand and like our bike racks out front were not enough and they're not going to be enough for mm -hmm. the amount of cyclists that are coming to northwest arkansas so like even today i would just purchase some stuff off of amazon to like make sure that they feel like their bikes are protected in the bathrooms mm -hmm. so like to, for someone to steal it they're literally gonna have to go into the bathroom run it all the way up to the front and for them no one to get spotted mm -hmm. would be pretty hard to do so we're taking that next step for investing in the cyclist and being more sustainable and coming to work in the gym. And as you, uh, you going back to some uh, something you said earlier, kind of a, about advocating for the conservation and just kind of introducing people to climbing in general, um, do you think there's room for um, mobile climbing situations going to events and doing like general outreach, with both to market the um, the gym, but also as part of that advocacy element. Yeah, I think uh, we actually have a event at Horseshoe coming up, mm -hmm. um, so where we're going to help sponsor. We're offering trivia, mm -hmm. um, so it's going to be climbers nice. trivia, um, and it's like you're going to Horseshoe, but at the same time you're learning wilderness survival. You're not you're learning how to repel like it's mm -hmm. it's a wide variety of things coming on or off the rock um but yeah i think that puts us in a unique position that we get to pitch about the gym but we also get to be at horseshoe canyon mm -hmm. which is like all of our staff again is just like <laughs> i would love to go yeah. you don't and even have to also pay like, me we would love to go that's why we <laughs> opened the gym so we could go do stuff like that <laughs> <Yeah>. too <laughs> but like really like I know Lincoln Lake and the Land Trust is working on a project with trying to like mm -hmm. make sure that we hold on to Lincoln Lake. Mm -hmm. And Lincoln Lake, if you've never been there, if you're, I didn't even know about it. And I lived in Farmington forever, but until I got into rock climbing, did I actually discover Lincoln Lake? And it is, you got rock climbing all the way around. Mm -hmm. um, you've got kayaking, you've got hiking, you've got fishing. I mean, Lincoln is just honestly perfect yeah, for right. anything you could want to do. Mm. A little five mile oasis. Yeah. But like trying, you know, I'm always inspired by the Berkeley race. You know, like I'm not sure if you guys have heard mm. of the Berkeley. No. Guy in Tennessee just created. Oh, this is the one where where it's not everybody makes it, no, right? No and it's it's multiple laps yeah. and oh, like yeah. I, I actually I saw a documentary on that. Yeah, yeah. that it's, was ridiculous. It's the most yeah. gnarly race. You literally yeah. ascend Everest, ascend and descend Everest twice in the middle of Tennessee. But and Horseshoe has Horseshoe Hell, and you climb for twenty four hours straight. So it's also a similar type of really hardcore thing. Wow. So we're like, I'm trying to like with me not being a cyclist and like mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out some type of like really cool rock climbing, trail running, mm -hmm. like almost adventure. Cause like in the Berkeley, you like there's little c navigation that you have to kind of do. It's kind of like a bush yeah. kind of thing. So like trying to do, trying to like scheme of something that like, all proceeds go to land conservation for land. I'll have to connect you a guy named Steve McBee. You may already know he runs an agency called Creative. He's kind of an ultra athlete. Oh, yeah. He paraglides. He runs. He, so he and some buddies came up with this thing in the remotest parts of Newton and Madison County called Man Dude. Yes. Have you yes. heard of this? No, so my ultimate buddy, ultimate friend buddy. <laughs> and, and it's always just kind of bizarre route that you shouldn't do and it's in the coldest time yeah. of the year where you're having to you're having to go across creeks and sometimes you get lost and it's all this kind of stuff and the whole point was at the end of it you're like man dude yeah <laughs> that was awesome yeah so so he would he would be a good one to help you scheme about that yeah. for sure i mean that means that we set up you know we set up a whole bunch of top ropes and just be like hey like just do as many routes you don't have to worry about leading or yeah. any of that kind of stuff and just going Very. out and climbing if it, anything where we can like generate some type of revenue that goes to expanding more sure. climbing and protecting what we do have so 
Well, I was selfishly thinking like mobile climbing walls that we could bring out here for Startup Crawl in That's September. That's what I thought. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I, thought I, was, I was like, That's literally okay. mobile climbing wall. How could I do that? Because uh-huh. our climbing wall is actually like concrete uh-huh. into the ground. But in the IFSC, they do have mobile climbing mm-hmm. walls where they're setting up it in like Utah Park mm-hmm. or whatever, so that they so they do exist. Mm-hmm. Uh, climbing walls are just really expensive. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, if once the ramble's done, mm-hmm. my goal is to hopefully team up with some of the big wigs around Northwest mm-hmm. Arkansas, Walton Foundation, and try to get the IFSC to come here because they do do this incredible setup. We have the financials to do it we have the right people we have the place and like once the rambles up if we get like a national rock or a world rock climbing competition set up i mean that right the here dream. in the middle yeah. of Fayetteville, that'd be Arkansas, cool mm-hmm. i mean yeah. it would so just put us on the map yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, i was thinking selfishly for our startup yeah. maybe, we, up maybe up we just have to make it a special yeah, stop exactly. you know i know we try to keep it kind of focused uh-huh. on the square and yes. on block but Maybe an extra point, have, special uh, stop. Have a bunch of scooters dropped off on the corner. Of exactly. Go that direction. But they need to do that before they start to pound the beers. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and for yes, sure. Please. Yeah. So Ben Mills that owns Fossil Cove, mm-hmm. he actually, like, his wall is like this, and he has two boards on it that he put climbing holds on. Huh. So you really could do it even in a space <laughs> like this, not where the windows are. Huh. But in, like, the wood space, you could absolutely build yourself a climbing The wall. university would love that. Yeah. Wouldn't they? Our, our landlord, yeah, they'd be like, know. oh, there's no liability with that. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. Just ask for forgiveness. Yeah, yeah I don't know exactly. what our landlord's going to do once she sees what we've done to the place. Forgiveness, <laughs> forgiveness not permission. No. Just don't, keep paying the rent and don't invite her in. I don't know I think that's probably the key. Do, yeah. But we'll figure that out when we get there. Yeah. Um, we like to uh, can conclude our, um, our episodes with a question to our guests. Um, if you have the ability to go back in time, and I know you are still you know pretty early on, um, but go back in time um, however far you want to go back. And with all the accumulated, accumulated knowledge you have now, uh, give your younger self advice before you embarked on this journey or even the journey that took place before this one. What advice might you give your younger self? I would say take the risk. Um, you know, I think we live in this like type of bubble. And whenever I look at like a big perspective, like me and Patrick talk about this a lot, I'm looking at... Um, you know, our life as a whole, like what is important to us, our friends, our family, the big picture type thing. So when you look at risk in that regard, it's like, okay, starting this business isn't as scary because the risk versus reward is a lot higher. So I would tell my younger self to just take the risk and not wait as long as I did. Yeah, I'm actually envious of Fallon and Jason. Like I'm a I'm 33, they're both in their 20s, and just, like, I'm really proud of just them, like, um, separating myself from them about, like, them being under 30 and taking this endeavor. Um, I just think is absolutely incredible. Um, I think my advice, um, man, just don't let fear guide you. I am really driven by fear, so it's actually really against my... um, my personality to do something like this. Um, but at the same time, like life's short, keep going. Um, don't ever, don't let your, like one thing that rock climbing I think actually does is like, it puts you in a, you can put yourself in a box, you know, like especially with rock climbing, like reaching for that next hold, it's really easy. Like it's only you versus the rock. So it's really easy for you to, Talk yourself out of like, hey, I can't do that. Well, you never know until you take a shot and you take a what you call a whipper when you fall off the rock. And um, yeah, there could be some consequences, but if you don't ever take it, if you don't ever shoot it, then you'll always be that same climber. You'll always be boxing within yourself. It's only you who tells you who you are. And just don't let your inner voice decide who you are. Uh, yeah, so I've been thinking of my answer. Um, <laughs> well, there's there's a benefit of going last, right? <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I've always taken calculated risks, so I knew going in what I was going to get into. Um, I don't know. I mean, I guess one of the things that I've s- I didn't realize that we would get as big as we are getting now 
um, just by looking at the numbers of the membership that have grown over the past several months, we are ahead of our bank projection by a lot. Yeah, um, good for you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, that, we, that's not the usual story for startups. <laughs> just so you know. Yeah, what we sent to the bank, we are about three or four months ahead of projection. Good for you. Yeah, that's um, great. I, so I guess if I were to go back in time and before starting his journey, I would tell myself think bigger, shoot for bigger, like because at some point we're going to max out our location and yeah. we're going to have to find another one. And maybe it would have been easier. If we just started with a bigger location and, you know, um, but obviously there's risk to that. So I think, I think where we're at right now, we took the right calculated risk and it paid, it played out. So. Very good. You know, if, if our listeners and viewers want to find out more about what you're doing, what's the best way for them to find out? Yeah, so our website, boldersandbrews.com. We have Instagram and Facebook, Boulders and Brews Gym. Uh, that's B O U L D E R S A N D B R E W S G Y M. And just follow It's us. a short handle. <laughs> no, right. no, no, no. Hey, that is how you spell it. Yeah. We try to stay uh, you know, as updated and recent, try to connect with the young the youngsters now, I guess, Gen Z. Sure, sure. <laughs> we, I mean, we're yeah. pretty young, but, yeah. <laughs> you know, like the, the kids that come into our gym, we try to stay connected with them. So that's that's where I would go. Thanks for coming on. This is great. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Congrats on all your success today. Thank you. You bet. Ecosystem builders, entrepreneurs, chambers of commerce, mayors, if you're interested in taking your economic future into your own hands, we've got a book that can help you. Creating Startup Junkies, Building Sustainable Venture Ecosystems in Unexpected Places is the guide. It's a little bit inspiration. It's a little bit toolkit. What it will allow you to do is take your economic future into your own hands and build a sustainable small business innovation and entrepreneurial ecosystem in your backyard. If you'd like to hear more, check out creatingstartupjunkies.com. The Startup Junkie podcast reaches over 100 countries and has had over 100,000 downloads. If you're interested in reaching some of the most motivated and engaged innovators and entrepreneurs on a worldwide basis, give us a shout.